Uh, and she's Professor of English at the University of New South Wales in Sydney, and she's the world's leading specialist on the great Australian and international writer Shirley Hazard. She, uh, Brigitte wrote the first critical study of Hazard's work in 2012, in which she described her as literary expatriate and cosmopolitan humanist words which we'll probably come back to. And she wrote eloquently in that book about Hazard as a finely calibrated narrative voice about her complex engagement with moral and ethical questions and her consideration of the inextricability of public and private worlds in which her, and, and, and about her writing a passionate love stories which are also moral dramas. And I'm sure many of those themes will come back tonight. Since then, she's edited her collected stories and has written the first and definitive biography of Shirley Hazard, which was published here by Virago um, a year ago and was greeted with huge and justified acclaim. And in the biography, she builds, uh, she expands and builds on those judgments of Hazard's work within a wonderful account of her complex, large-scale, rich and much-travelled life, which is recreated here with a marvellous precision and empathy and energy. So I'm very much looking forward to hearing more about that life um, and something about the making and the contents of, of this book. So please make Brigitte very welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Hermione, and thank you to Anna and Kate and everybody for making my, my visit here um, possible, for the invitation, for um, the opportunity to come back. Um, and I suppose I could say really that I half began thinking about writing um, the biography of Hazard while I was here, even though I was, I was working on a different, a different project. So in my talk tonight, I'm going to start by talking about why Shelley Hazard is such an important writer, what it is about her writing that I find compelling and that I think readers would find compelling. I talk a little bit about her life and, and all the way through I'm kind of weaving in passages from the biography uh, as, as I work and then I'm going to end by talking about the, some of the practical questions of writing this particular biography, being the first, uh, the first biographer uh, writing from uncurated materials. And I'm going to end with a kind of conundrum of biography, of the, the promise of biography to tell the truth that, that arose in, uh, in a review, a, a lovely review in lots of ways, um, of the book in the LRB quite recently, a month or so, or so back. So uh, here we go. And I do have some, most of the quotes from the novel, uh, the novels are, are up on the slides and I have a couple of pictures as well. So before I ca became Shirley Hazard's biographer, I was one of her readers. I was a devoted reader. I had read The Transit of Venus in 1981, just after it came out. At that time, I was about to begin my graduate studies in English, and literature was very much at the heart of my life. It brought the world alive for me. It made things matter. But literature was, it seemed to me then, mostly concerned with other worlds, other times and places. It touched me profoundly, but it didn't seem to touch the world I lived in. The transit of Venus seemed somehow to be different in the way it paid attention to lives that seemed close to mine, young women, Australians. And it paid attention through the medium of prose of the utmost gravity and beauty, prose that took itself seriously, that impelled its readers to take it and themselves and the work of reading seriously. So that was what um, absolutely hooked me in as a reader. On the first page of Transit, I read this. This is the first paragraph of the novel. By nightfall, the headlines would be reporting devastation. It was simply that the sky on a shadeless day lowered itself like an awning. Purple silence petrified the limbs of trees and stood crops upright in the fields like hair on end. Whatever there was of fresh white paint sprang out from downs or dunes or lacerated with a streak of fencing. This occurred shortly after midday on a summer Monday in the south of England. And this extraordinary sequence of sentences, in a way, embodies the upheaval that a reader undergoes when we are immersed in great novels. 
the landscape around us, familiar and banal, is upended, made strange, as the Russian formalists had it, made thrilling and unexpected. With the upheaval comes threat, what the narrator will later call the threat and promise of meaning. And also comes beauty, unfurling in phrases and sentences that seem to be carrying more weight than the storm they are describing. That unfurling is bedded into the structure and sequence of the sentences. I counted four stressed syllables in the first, eight in the next, and then 12, luring us into larger and longer moments. The sentences scan like lines of poetry. Whatever there was of fresh white paint sprang out from Downs or Dunes, five stressed syllables in a row. And the sound drama is then carried over into the alliteration, whatever was white, and then Downs and Dunes with their half rhymes. I can still remember my excitement back then in 1981. I wanted whatever was coming next. The storm swept over me and went on for another page or two. The New York Times critic Parul Seagull wrote recently at the reissue of this novel, the US reissue of this novel in 2021. I think I have this quote. Did it ever rain in fiction, really properly rain before the transit of Venus? Has the mud streamed in that particularly vivid way? Has a character stuffed his sopping cap into his waterlogged boot pockets, squelched indoors and stood horribly aware of the smell of his wet socks, the way Ted Tice does, watching his cheap suitcase leak its orange dye all over the floor. After finishing Transit, I tracked down Hazard's two earlier novels and devoured them. They were strange and compelling in different ways, undoing and remaking the forms of pastoral romance and comedy. But in these shorter works too, I found the poetry of her lines, charging the story that simmered and flowed beneath them with a kind of electricity. I'll, I'll give you an example. In the Bay of Noon, a young Englishwoman is living in Naples in the 1950s. She meets a, a fascinating, slightly older Italian couple and an oblique Scotsman with whom she has a kind of flirtation that goes nowhere. Near the end of the novel, on the second last page, the protagonist, who has returned to Naples some little time after the events that make up the story, reflects that epoch, our time at Naples, seems historic now. It doesn't seem like modern life, but it didn't seem like modern life then either. It was more like life than modern life, more lifelike, livelier, likelier. I wrote about this passage in the biography. This is writing that works, as one reviewer put it at the time it came out, on the nerve endings, not the cerebrum. <laughs> the play of sound in these sentences Rococo, insistent, connects like to life in all their permutations, connects the work of figuration, of writing, of poetry, to the question of living, to the enlivening and enduring power of words. And I'll come back to that relationship between life and, and poetry um, at the end of the paper. Here, though, Hazard's sentences school us in reading. They force us to become uncommonly attentive. I want to return for a minute to the picture I started with, a young woman reading about another young woman, both of them Australians, living small and unimportant lives. The American literary critic Wai Chi Dimmock argued that this kind and quality of attention to the insignificant and the small is intrinsic to the genre of the novel. She writes that one of the things that novels do is to affect a massive shift of scale that novels work in the gaps between the small and the large, between the person and the world. She has this to say about Henry James's heroine. Isabel Archer's suffering is inflicted upon her, not by a nation or a public institution, but by a private individual, an expatriate no less. No major event on the national calendar is inscribed in this puny ruin of one woman's happiness. And yet this despicable size is just what makes it non, not despicable within the sponge-like texture of the novel, because the novel is, in fact, of uncertain dimensions. It can be bumped up to a much larger scale. In Dimmock's argument, this shift in scale is fundamental to the way that novels provide what she calls a small entry to a large fact, creating a break also in the novel's account of human affairs, 
a point where the small and the large come up against each other. She writes, this is what novelistic subjectivity amounts to. Its frame is indeed global, but the global here bearing the compass of time enfolds rather than erases its scalar opposite. The large and significant embrace the small and unimportant, the young woman, the Australian, and of course we have here a, a kind of blueprint for biography itself. This is why and how we come to care so much for the American Isabel Archer, or indeed for the Australian Caro Bell, or for the English Ted Tice, or in Shirley Hazard's last novel, for Helen Driscoll, whose story, Hazard herself said, was based very much on her own youthful life. Helen Driscoll sitting in her bedroom in Wellington, New Zealand, heartbroken, recording in letters the uneventful events and the suburban scenes that make up her days. On the other side of the Great Fires globe, in the northern provinces of England, the novel pauses to attend to the whole world that is to be found in a pile of firewood. The scrubby bark, coruscated, or the smooth, angular pieces like bones, forms arched and grooved like a lobster or humped like a whale, dark joints to which foliage adhered like bay leaves in a stew, pine cones and a frond of pine leaves still flourishing on the hacked branch, and the creatures that inched or sped or wriggled out, knowing the game was up, slugs, pale worms, tiny white grubs scurrying busily off as if to a destination, an undulant caterpillar and an inexorable thing with pincers, I know that creature, or the slow slide of an unhoused snail, the hodmodod as they call him here, revisiting the lichens and pigmentations and fungoid flakes that had clung to his only home, freckled growths dusted seemingly with cocoa, red berries, globules of white wax. The animation here is equal to that of transit, the transit of Venus's storm. It slows time. It demands our richest attention. The large is better than the small. Hazard's novels strive to connect themselves and their readers to the great achievements of literature, to poetry itself. And that's hugely unfashionable. It was absolutely not the tenor of the 1980s and, and 70s and 80s when she was writing. Um, this is gesture back to the grand century of the novel in the 19th century in, in much of her writing. But more than reconnecting to the great traditions of the novel, her impulse is to poetry itself, um, and she gestures towards that as she turns our attention to the ordinary, the lived, and the unremarked. So who was this woman who wrote that ensorcelled prose, and how did she come to writing? She had always, she said, lived in poetry, she was born in 1931 and grew up on Sydney's North Shore, it's quite an affluent part of Sydney, in an unhappy family of less than modest origins. Both her parents began their lives in circumstances of illegitimacy and material deprivation, and their adult selves were marked by the lack and the misery. Everyone in the family was, it seems, antipathetic and insular, even this photo as they're leaving Hong Kong in 1948, everyone's looking in a different direction. There's no, no connection between the people in this family at all. It's no accident that all the protagonists in her fiction are orphans or changelings, their origins obscure. The very young Shirley took to literature as compensation. Dickens, Conrad, Browning were early loves, then Hardy, above all his poetry, George Eliot, Byron, Auden, her father, Reg, channeled his unhappiness into adultery, alcohol and ambition. He rose from nowhere to become Australian Trade Commissioner, first to Hong Kong at the end of World War II, then more glitteringly to New York at the end of 1951, taking his family and his mistress with him. In 1953, he ran off with the mistress, after which Shirley had very little contact with him. He wrote in a letter a decade or so later, having seen a photograph of her, it is a peculiar thing to look at a picture of your own daughter and realise that with the lapse of time, I could have passed you in the street and not have recognised. Mm -hmm. It's such a heartbreaking sense of, of a, a riven family. Gets worse. Her mother, known, Catherine, known as Kit, unstable, bipolar, attached herself to Shirley, who cared for and ran from her mother in equal measure, a dreadful misery that lasted until Kit's death in 1985. 
Kit was also a deeply and darkly comic figure. Shelley's letters are full of the comedy. I'll just quote a few. My mother writes me that she has a bad foot and oh how characteristic is walking extra hard on it as that is usually the best cure. <laughs> Shirley regularly sent Kit dresses from New York and Kit sent back Christmas cakes from Sydney leading to moments like this. Um, this is from a letter to one of um, Shirley, uh, Shirley's Australian friends. I'm glad she wore the dress. The last dress was greeted with return letters saying, one needs more than dresses. In the present letter, she says she is sending us a Christmas cake, but not a good one. <laughs> Goes on, that sounds like a threat, perhaps appropriate. When Shirley wrote to Kit that her husband, the acclaimed biographer Francis Stiegmuller, was considering writing a biography of Stravinsky, the great composer Stravinsky, and was visiting um, to look through the papers that he kept in his apartment, Kit replied to Shirley that the Christmas cake that she'd just posted was a biggish one, so perhaps you can halve it for Mrs Stravinsky, <laughs> and so on. It, it wasn't always funny. Shirley and her sister Valerie seem to have reserved their greatest animosity always for each other. Their tastes and inclinations were diametrically opposed, they went into battle. From New York, Shirley penned long, furious letters to Valerie in Sydney, and Valerie responded in kind. Shirley warned Kit to stay clear of Valerie, and Kit wrote regularly to both of them that she would prefer just to disappear. It went on and on, unresolvable, some kind of primal battle. When Shirley died in 2016, it was learnt that Valerie had died two years earlier, also with dementia, there had long been no contact between them. But away from her family, Shirley Hazard's life unfolded in quite other directions. New York in the 1950s with its rich literary scene, home to magazines that paid well for short fiction and poetry and reviews, along with its large cosmopolitan, there's that word again, culture seems to have been exactly the right place for her to begin again to invent herself. It was there that she met her husband, Francis Stiegmuller, 25 years older. He had published 14 books when they met, and he was extensively connected with the most elevated literary circles in Manhattan. They were introduced to each other by Muriel Spark. Oh, I, maybe I do have that picture. Yes. So this is a uh, postcard Muriel famously sent to Shirley um, when she was in New York, uh, staying at the Beaux-Arts Hotel, um, this is a photo of the Bozar, and she's marked her window there on the side saying the scene of the first encounter in capitals between Shirley Hazard and Francis Diegmuller by Muriel Spark, her best book ever. Um, so Stiegmuller had inherited a significant art collection, included a Pissarro, some Picassos, a Rodin, a Braque, many Villons, a Delacroix, Parmigianino, amongst others. And he also inherited some money from his first wife, Beatrice Stein, who's a fascinating figure in, in herself. And this meant that he and Shirley were able to devote themselves to writing. Uh, when funds ran low, they sold a painting. Um, so I'm going back to the previous slide. So she worked as a typist. She didn't finish high school. She never went to university. She was the most extraordinary autodidact, one of the most well-read and erudite writers I've ever come across. Um, here she is, though, in her office job in the UN, yes, painting her nails, so an excellent suit. Um, did not take her work seriously as a stenographer and um, was, was treated with re reciprocal um, disrespect by the institution. She also began writing stories. In 1960, one of her stories was read by the legendary New Yorker editor, William Maxwell, who accepted it and asked her to send more. Now, she always claimed that that story was the first one she ever wrote and that she sent it off to the magazine and never kept a copy and that Maxwell had just by chance plucked it out of the slush pile. Um, it was just, you know, obviously so destined to be published. In fact, I learned she had been writing stories and sending them off for a little while, for some years. It's kind of relief to know, um, you know, that she had, had to have an apprenticeship. And she had received several rejections, including at least one from Maxwell. Nonetheless, Maxwell later reflected that she had seemed from the start to have been a finished literary artist about whom they knew nothing whatever. He said she must have gone through a period of apprenticeship of one kind or another, but under whose eyes? Her own, I would think. So there's this sense of her as having arrived perfectly formed. She was very committed to that story about herself, even covering over you know, some of those early almost failures. Um, and I 
As I went through her papers, I never found the manuscripts. I found finished typescripts only of, of her work. And I think this was also part of maintaining that sense of her own ungilded perfection. Um, even though she was happy to say the Transit of Venus went through 20 to 30 drafts of each page. So she's happy to admit she's you know, a perfectionist, but she didn't want anyone to see them. That was a great, a great disappointment. Um, OK, so the Stiegmuller's married life was described by their friend, the great, now late, poet and translator Richard Howard as a conjugal version of literary high life. Francis, as I said, was a scholar of French literature. He made one of the definitive translations of Madame Bovary in 1957. And in the first decade of their marriage, they spent months of each year in France, in Paris, where they had rooms at the Ritz, or visiting Francis's friend, the eclectic art collector Douglas Cooper in his Chateau de Castille near Uzès in Provence. They lived also often for months at a stretch in Italy, first in Tuscany, a rented farmhouse, Shirley called it, outside Florence, and later in rented rooms on Capri and on Naples. Naples was perhaps the most important place in the world for Shirley Hazard. She had been sent there by the UN in late 1957 while she was still pursuing her unhappy career as a stenographer and had fallen deeply for the city. It was like no other place she had lived. She wrote of it as a blitzed town of large-eyed, overburdened, resilient people. Many of its churches and palaces lay open to the elements. Its waterfront was a shambles. As well as the massive bombardment of war itself, compounded by the recent eruption of Vesuvius in 1944, Naples had continued to struggle from what she called recent ravages of dictatorship and conquest. It did not attract foreigners. She felt herself to have been one of the privileged few foreigners who were living in the city in those years, one of those, as she put it, who came to know Naples in that era and who would feel attachment to it all their lives. This is interesting. She did live briefly in Tuscany, but it was Naples that really absolutely consolidated. It's not the textbook Italy that we might, we might think of. In the 1960s, when one of her notebooks, she wrote in memory of her earliest days in the city. This is, a, a, I find, very moving, beautiful sentence, sentences. There were many times that I walked in Naples in a kind of delight of observation and strangeness, the desire to observe and the happiness of having all this to lavish it on. Naples was the place where she perhaps began to feel herself at home. Her infrequent return visits to Australia offered some substantial points of reconnection, but never a sense of home or belonging. She used to lament that Sydney in the 1930s and 40s had been a cultural desert. She said, in the circles where I was raised, I knew of no one knowledgeable in the visual arts, no one who regularly attended musical performances, and only two adults other than my teachers who spoke without embarrassment of poetry and literature, both of these being women. As far as I can recall, I never heard a man refer to a good or a great book. I knew no one who had mastered or even studied another language from choice. In The Transit of Venus, the young Caro Bell reflects on Australia's intractable hospitality to beauty and to moment. There was nothing mythic at Sydney. Momentous objects, beings and events all occurred abroad or in the elsewhere of books. Sydney could never take for granted, as did the very meanest town in Europe, that a poet might be born there or a great painter walk beneath its windows. The likelihood did not arise. They did not feel they had deserved it. That was the, there was, sorry, that was the measure of resentful obscurity. They could not imagine a person who might expose or exalt it. There was the harbour and the open sea. It was an atmosphere in which a sunset might be comfortably admired but not much else. Any more private joy in light or dark, in leaf or gatepost, savoured of revelation and was uncountenanced. Even in wisteria or wattle, on mornings newer surely than anywhere else could by now achieve. There was a stillness on certain evenings, or a cast to rocks, or a design of languid branch against the sky that might be announcing glory though it could hardly be right to relish where Dora, that's the stepsister, the modelled on Shirley's mother, of course, where Dora was aggrieved 
The girls put their smooth faces to gardenias, inhaling December for a lifetime. It's a very beautiful passage. The poetic charge of these lines derives not only from their evocative precision, but also from a sense that these images are being encountered for the first time. There is a tight enfolding of poetry with childhood memory, a combination of prospect and retrospect that is strikingly Hazard's own. The sensual experience of stillness or of gardenias is already washed with lost time. And what we are being given access to is not simply a past and a particular place and moment, the summer, December sense of a 1930s Sydney childhood, but also a landscape of poetic and bodily apprehension. Hazard later reflected on this, but as a phenomenon of memory itself. In 1984, in one of her rare returns to Sydney, she told an interviewer that she had been struck by the particularity of place and time, a winter's day in August, and by the alignment of a certain quality of light with memory. Struck by the gap of 30 years since she had last encountered the city in mid-year, and struck surely after all this time by the Antipodean surprise of winter sunshine in August, just as by the scent of gardenias in December, she discovered that, she felt, life has properties of memory, like the scents of flowers. I find myself walking along and looking at Sydney and having memories pour over me. The whole content of one's youth and one's experience that's lingering somewhere in one's mind is brought to attention by this quality of light. Um, we, going back to the conversation we had this morning about those early years for writers. And despite this lyricism, her relations with Australia remained thorny and unresolved. Uh, in 1984, when she was back in Sydney, she'd been invited to deliver a series of prestigious lectures on the ABC, the national broadcaster. And the response to her lectures was, was pretty cranky, possibly because of the trenchant criticism she delivered. She wrote sternly of what she saw as a rise of nationalist sentiment in Australia and what she judged a reluctance by Australians to reflect critically on themselves. Here's just a sentence or two. Australia is not an innocent country. This nation's short recorded history is shadowed into the present day by the fate of its native peoples, by forms of unyielding prejudice, by a strain of derision and unexamined violence, and by a persistent current of misogyny. It's kind of astonishing that she was surprised that people were upset, right? I mean, it would not be unusual or hostilely uh, received today, I don't think. I think that's a much more common reading of Australia. Um, but in 1984, people did not talk that way um, about, about Australia. And critics of her lectures sidestepped all of that and homed in instead on the fact that she had quoted a whole lot of poetry and very little of it was Australian. So that, that was seen to be an insult. One critic dismissed her lectures as a speech day address by the headmistress of a girl's private school and criticised her apparent ignorance of contemporary Australian thought and letters. The mocking tone hit home. She wrote in her diary after reading his review and, and others like it, what hatred and self-hatred, what hatred in that paradoxical Australia, these reviews, primitive, unleashed. This is what I was writing about in the talks. It is the appalling lust for exposure, the playground bully blustering around in so many, many Australians, predominantly, but not only men, the seizing like a beast on what they take for the sight of blood, the need to regard an utterance from the heart as an opportunity to stick the knife in. She continued, what a dispiriting episode, what a wretched outcome to my work and thought to do with those lectures and my beautiful visit to Australia. This would be the end, she felt. How hard for me to learn such lessons. Australia is a fated connection for me. So I began the talk with a moment of my reading, my own discovery of the transit of Venus in 1981. 40 years later, in 2021, I finished writing Hazard's biography. The move from reader to literary critic to biographer is not a seamless one. I had not intended to write a biography. I had resisted the suggestion when it was made to me by Hazard's um, executors. And to give a sense, and I'm a little nervous about saying this here, in this context, but to give a sense about how I felt about biography before I began writing, 
I have completely changed my tune. And how I also feel about the matter now. I want to read a, a passage, a couple of sentences, from Rosanna Warren's recent biography of the Cubist poet Max Jacob. I don't know if anyone's read it or is familiar with Jacob's work. Um, so Rosanna Warren is an American poet and literary scholar. And in her preface, she writes about how Max Jacob had inspired a couple of poems in her first collection of poetry published in the early 1980s when she was completing her graduate studies. She writes, I remember with electrical clarity the phone call from my editor suggesting that I write a biography of Jacob. In the sublime arrogance of youth, I replied that I would never write a biography, that it was a low mimetic mode. Lord knows I've been sufficiently chastened, but since then. <laughs> I too have been chastened by the process of writing this book, which I took on after Hazard's death out of a sense of responsibility. Another term we were talking about in the seminar this morning. I had spent the previous half decade writing about her work and I took that up because I saw that no other academics were doing it. So she was still being read out in the world. Her last book won the US National Book Award and the, the, the biggest um, Australian prize. It was shortlisted for the Orange Prize here. She'd been shortlisted for the Lost Booker. Um, her books have remained in print, certainly in the UK and Australia, but she had never been the subject of scholarly attention. So on that basis, it seemed to me that what was needed was a serious literary biography. While the quality and the achievement of her writing, I think, are self-evident, the story of her literary career, her writing life, was less obvious and also less leg legible. So I was writing the first biography of a figure who was acclaimed and well-known and at the same time also unknown, underread and, and obscure. I was given full access to her papers, which at that stage was still in her apartment, seriously, utterly unsorted. Over several visits, I worked through three large dishevelled trunks, piles and piles of ratty old news clippings, mainly about the United Nations, which is one of her obsessions. There were gems like the aerogram I found from C. Blake of Hurstville in Sydney that turned out to be an aerogram from the great Christina Stead. I found Stieg Muller's Légion d'honneur medal and rattling alongside it in the trunk, I found a paper bag containing two bottles of Nembutal a note in Stieg Muller's hand saying 40 to 50 Nembutals slowly alongside booklets from the Hemlock Society from the late 1980s. Francis's exit plan stymied most likely by the onset of his dementia. So there's this kind of awkwardly private um, events and moments from their lives that one stumbles upon and thinks about, is this part of the biography? What do I do with this, this intimate kind of knowledge that was never meant for anyone else's eyes. The research drenched me in Hazard's personal life, the terrible letters from and to her mother and sister, the diaries and notebooks where she wrote down flashes of thought or images, phrases, alongside the chronicle of rage and hurt and joy at events and relationships, and then the long heartbreaking record of her lonely widowhood, the, and following that, the early signs of her own dementia, which she was terrifyingly aware of um, as, it, as it began. Biographies like novels are scalar, they draw us across the large and the small, they compel us to imagine and remember lives both familiar and strange. As I worked painstakingly through all this material, I set it against the account of her life and self that Hazard had herself provided in interviews and other public contexts, but also in her novels, those moments that I found drew on her own experience, moments that are embroidered or complicated to become fiction and to create new worlds. And I used a lot of those passages from the novels, particularly passages describing locations, Sydney, Naples and so on, um, in, in the biography to allow her to recreate that world, the world of her life, um, through her fiction. So I'm, I'm going to finish the, the talk now by talking about a kind of conundrum that, that arose. Um, so one of the questions the biography that I had to address in the biography was the question of Francis Stigmuller's sexuality. There were rumours that he was gay. And when I first heard the rumours, I was really keen for them to be true. This would, I thought, explain everything. Particularly, I won't, you know, the spoiler alert, but there is a profound betrayal at the heart of at least one of Hazard's novels. But 
It would also satisfy the urge to find a cause sitting behind the complexity with which she writes about sexual love across all of her work. And I'll talk a bit more about how that complexity in a minute. So I thought, great, this would be really good. It's exactly what I want to find out. And so I investigated the rumours. And I kept hearing, oh, everyone knew. Everyone knew, you know. Shirley knew. No, well, she didn't know, you know. Everyone knew. Um, so I read everything. I asked everyone that I interviewed who'd known Francis or knew about him, what they knew. And what I heard over and over was that everyone knew. It was assumed. I learnt by the family of Stigmala's first wife. It was spoken about in New York literary worlds, particularly in New Yorker circles, where it was circulated mainly by one of Shirley's adulterous affairs from her youth, so I'm going on there, uh, gay literary circles also. The um, English art historians Hugh Honor and John Fleming, who, who knew the Stigmalers in Tuscany uh, in the 60s and 70s, were a major source of these stories. and I think they heard them from Muriel Spark. Um, they were really amused, one of their friends that I spoke to said, that Shirley seemed to be completely aware, uh, completely unaware, or rather had reinvented Francis as this perfect role model of a husband, where he's, he had been, in their view, a very active sort of homosexual. Okay, so that's on the other hand. On the other hand, another very famous art historian, John Pope Hennessy, a very good friend of the Stigmullers, dismissed suggestions that Francis was closeted. Pope Hennessy's partner, Michael Mallon, recalled when Honor and Fleming brought up once again the subject of Francis's supposed repressed homosexuality. He said, yes, yeah, so that is an interesting subject, but not, I think, one that applies to Francis. Other friends had similar doubts. John Richardson, another art critic, former partner of Douglas Cooper, said he had initially assumed Francis to be homosexual, but later decided that he, that he just wasn't. So as well as that real world evidence, I worked through the literary evidence. One you know, compelling piece of evidence seemed to be what I call the gay codedness of so many of Stigmuller's literary subjects, Flaubert, Cocteau, Queen Christina, uh, Isadora Duncan, the drag aerialist from Texas, Barbette, and also the persistence of figures of sexual complication in Hazard's own fiction. These were particularly important, and I wrote about them in the biography. I wrote, as a writer, Shirley Hazard was in no sense innocent or unaware of the complicated routes that sexual desire takes, as is everywhere evident in her fiction. I was referring to, and, and I go into this in some detail in the novels, declarations of incestuous desire. The protagonist of The Bay of Noon says, I went to Naples because I was in love with my brother. There's also persistent imagery that plays endlessly on gender fluidity and cross-dressing alongside heterosexual and homosexual sex. I quote the protagonist of The Great Fire who writes in a letter, the experiment of love is itself aberrant more often than not and doesn't lend itself to classification. And I observe that Hazard was aware of such complexities in the lives of her friends that she had spoken to John Cheever's biographer about this aspect of Cheever's life, and that she also noted of William Maxwell that Bill never made a secret of the fact that he'd had a homosexual life before his marriage. There's more, but you get the picture. After months and years of research, it was clear to me that while it was perfectly plausible that Stigmuller had been gay, it was equally plausible that, that he had not been. In the biography, I, I summed up the, the evidence, and then I wrote, from all of this, not much can really be deduced with any certainty, and nothing that would challenge or disrupt recognition of Stigmuller and Hazard's devotion to each other. What remains and remains important for Shirley Hazard's life is that she found happiness in marriage to a man with inclinations towards literary and artistic figures and subjects, marked by complexity rather than transparency, with a preference for the undisclosed rather than the vaunted truth, interests that drew her to him, which she shared. Those few sentences took a very long time to write. It was possibly the most difficult part of the biography for me. It spoke to the need to tell the truth, as I'd been able to determine it, without distorting the facts to fit a preferred narrative. My biography has been widely and generously reviewed, and I'm extremely grateful for that. I'm you know, stunned and, and deeply pleased. Not all of the reviews mention the matter of Stigmuller's sexuality, 
they just take it in their stride. Of those that, that did mention, several said something about the tact and delicacy I'd shown in my treatment of the matter, which I thought was a little bit of a surprise. It was a surprise. I don't feel particularly tactful or indeed delicate. Um, but, uh, but also I was thinking this care that I had taken to be accurate and precise in the face of indeterminacy and complexity seemed to be an intellectual or a, a writing kind of achievement rather than a personal quality. But anyway, there it was. One reviewer, and this is the one I, I mentioned earlier in a review in the um, LRB that included a long and elegant discussion of Hazard's work and significance, and for which, again, I'm hugely grateful, described my treatment of Francis Stigmuller's sexuality as coy, and to support the claim referred selectively to the evidence that I had compiled and presented in the book. That is, they, she only referred to the evidence that supported the claim that Stigmuller was gay and omitted the evidence that indicated that he wasn't. So I found this really interesting the desire, the demand that biography as a genre reveal some kind of hidden truth, something that we didn't know before. But the, the figure of closeted sexuality becomes a kind of exemplar of that truth that must be revealed. Um, and certainly I'd had that desire myself when, when I started out and was schooled by the process of writing the biography into realising that naming something is not going to tell necessarily tell the truth of it. Just a little bit more. The reviewer went further, writing that Stigmuller must surely have recognised himself in the figure of Justin. So Justin is that oblique Scotsman with whom the protagonist of The Bay of Noon has a kind of flirtation that goes nowhere. And he is coded as, as a kind of a girl all the way through um, in, in, in very oblique kinds of ways, um, in terms of, in particular, gender-crossing imagery. So he becomes a figure for indeterminacy of all kinds. In my discussion of the novel Bay of Noon in the biography, I frame my reading of these aspects of the character of Justin in a discussion of the novel's engagement, what I read as the novel's engagement, with the structures of comedy, specifically Shakespeare's Twelfth Night. And for that I drew on Marjorie Garber's famous account of the transvestic figure as the mechanism for Eros. Garber writes, nobody gets Cesario or Ganymede but Cesario or Ganymede is necessary to falling in love. In other words, my reading of that character and that, um, and that novel attend to the complex textuality of Hazard's writing, to what we might also call the work of figuration, the work of writing or poetry. And I attended to the ways these are connected to questions of living and the life lived. And so that's where I want to leave the talk with the reminder that with literary biography, we cannot leave the literary text, the sentences, the poetry, the complexity out of the picture. That textuality always informs a literary biography in that it precludes or thwarts any straight alignments between reality and fiction, whatever we might want to uncover or discover as we read. Thank you. Exchange a few words and then um, whatever questions you want to ask. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. There's so much to talk about. <laughs> Good. Great. I'll just unmute myself so that you can hear me in a complicated process. Right. Now can you hear me? You can yeah. hear me anyway. Yeah. Good. Um, yes, we, we had a workshop this morning, so uh, Brigitte has been harking back to that a little bit, in which we taught the word responsibility uh, came up quite often. Um, and, uh, and we were talking about the, the particular responsibility of being the first one, as it were, um, and also of writing about, for the first time biographically, writing about an author who's got very different reputations mm -hmm. in different hemispheres, um, and in some places has been completely forgotten, uh, and in other places is still, you know, like a, a certain few streets in New York, for instance, <laughs> is sort of absolute heroin. Yes. Um, so, and of course, the responsibility of being first also means that a lot of people are still alive, the people you talk to yes. uh, about her. So I, I wanted to ask you, I wanted to press a bit more on that issue of responsibility and what the difficulties were for you of being that first person, coming 
fresh to this, yes. uh, obviously as being her, her critic and her yes. specialist, but, but coming into the world of people who knew her and presumably were still quite sort of breathing. Yes, How yes, very much. Um, well, I suppose the phenomenon that I talked about just then is, was one of them, you mm -hmm. know, um, one, of, one of those things that I had to kind of deal with because there were certainly quite proper old friends of, of hers that were saying, I hope you're not going to deal with that terrible, you know, those ridiculous rumours, but I, I kind of have to, you know, it's... it's um, so, uh, and there were, there were other responsibilities around um, affairs that she'd had, you know, the children of some of those men were still alive. I had to kind of get in touch with people and talk to them. Did you know your, your father had had an affair with this woman who, who went on to become mm. a famous writer? And that was kind of quite challenging yeah. in, in some cases. And given the family tensions and conflicts, were there family yes. descents who had sort of taken sides? Absolutely. So, um, ah, she spoke a lot in interviews and so on about how terrible all her family were. Uh, and she said her, her sister was, was monstrous and was a, you know, that she and her husband had returned to Australia basically because of the white Australia policy and that they felt they were racist and they felt Australia was a better place than America in, in, um, during the civil rights kind of era. Um, so that, that was kind of confronting mm -hmm. um, and I thought I, I need to find out the truth of that and, and the truth of the monstrousness of the sister. Uh, and the sister had um, three children, one of them had died the other two were twins who were estranged, and so one of the twins never answered. But I did talk to Valerie's son, uh, Hamlin, who had had a terribly, so he was, again, very one-sidedly supporting his mother in, in the, the debates. And he told me that when he'd returned to America as a, you know, in his late teens or early 20s, he'd written to Hazard and, and said, I would love to come and meet my famous aunt. And she'd, you know, respond with just a couple of sentences, kind of, you know, um, not encouraging. Not keen. Not keen. Um, she didn't want anything to do with them. And, and I could still hear all these decades mm. later the hurt mm. in, in his voice. So part of your job, presumably, was to hold the balance. Hold the balance. Um, because it, it's some things you say about her. Uh, I mean, I'm like you, a huge admirer uh, of the work. Uh, I only met her once on the on the staircase of the Century uh -huh. Club in, in, in New York was immediately absolutely riveted. But I can see from some of the things you've said that she could be, I, don't, I hate to use the phrase, the outmoded phrase, difficult, but you know, she never stopped talking. Uh, she was incredibly uh, obsessive and angry about a lot of things. Including the United Nations. She made a lot of enemies. She had a, you know, so yeah. did your devotion waver at any point? My devotion was never to her as a person. Okay. Yeah. It was absolutely to the books, to the you know, to the stories, the sentences, um, uh, above all. And I, that's one of the reasons I resisted. Really, was I, I don't care. She's had this incredibly privileged life. She's been really fortunate. And, and what's what is interesting about this story, you know? And it, it was grudgingly in the set of responsibility. And then I discovered she was a much more interesting person, much more nuanced. There was plenty of darkness. Um, there was the melancholy, which to me enriches the, mm -hmm. the novels so much, mm -hmm. and she never lost that. Um, there's the rage and fury, and I suppose one of the things that would have made her difficult as a person, but makes her really interesting as as a historical figure, um, is that she, you know, as I said, she her writing is about taking writing seriously. She took herself seriously right from the start. She knew she was special. She knew she was beautiful. Mm -hmm. She knew she was really smart and she knew she could write. Yes. And she was not taking no from anyone. And you know, people kept you know, <laughs> letting her down to disastrous love affairs, you know, always with older married men, I mean. She kind of went for the sort of person who's bound to let her down. <laughs> 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 you know, she had that work <laughs> But she was, she was also very hostile to um, psychoanalysis and Freud right. in particular. Right. So, you know, <laughs> yeah, <she was laughs> calling Dr. Freud right now yeah. <laughs> with that. Um, yeah, so, and that difficulty and that sense of her seriousness and that hankering back to an older style of intellectual life. Did, you know, her husband was so much older and, yeah. and it's like she got older when she married him. Did, and he mixed did, did, did you, but come back to that, that's so interesting. Did, did you have any kind of bias that you yourself had to get over as a biographer about the fact that she was so 
BC about Australia a lot of the time. I mean, here you are, you know, a distinguished Australian <laughs> who lives in Australia, and um, her, her stories, you know, yes, got out as soon as she possibly could. Whenever she goes back, she's incredibly rude to everyone. Oh, well, she kind of is, isn't, isn't, isn't she right? Oh, I, mean, exactly. I, I know, I know, it's really, it's really true. The thing is, in 1984, when I heard those Boyer lectures, and I was writing my, my master's thesis on her at the time, and I thought, you know, go Shirley, this is, this is fantastic. And, but also, I mean, I'm the daughter of an immigrant. And what my father said about Australia was precisely that. You know, who are these people? They have no culture. They have <laughs> so that was the Australia that, that I learned at my father's knee. And Shirley was making the same kind of point. So I was then shocked to go out and find that not everybody thought that this was a good thing to say. Um, so, yep. it's you know, complicated. It's complicated. Yeah. So what, what is an Australian? Um, you know, my impulse is, is also to go out into the world, you know, as much as to fall in love with the light, the harbour, you know, yes. that, that beauty, and, yes. and, and there are other, you know. And she was a great champion of Australian writing, mm. um, to the extent that a um, fairly minor but interesting Australian writer called Dale Stevens wrote a letter to her thinking that she had some kind of job as a talent scout for the New Yorker because she had placed so many Australian writers and connected them, including Murray Bale, they connected them to, to editors of the New Yorker. Going back to this question of responsibility and, and being the first person on the scene, um, I would kill for the kind of archive that you had. I mean, this is incredible, the archive you had. The diaries, the notebooks, the appointment diaries, the letters. But here's the question before you tell me more about that. Um, was it too much? Was it was it a problem as well as a gift to have this huge unsorted? There's resource? a lot. Uh, it's hard to believe. There's a lot I didn't put in. There's a lot I, I, I left out for you know reasons. I did feel the need to put in certain kinds of detail about her engagement with the world, particularly during after her marriage to Steve Muller, they were roaming around Europe and they meet everybody. And, and some of these are just these little vignettes, of, uh, quite eccentric vignettes, and she's writing them all down. And this is the world that she wants to kind of retain, to capture, to, to connect with. And that, for me, was um, distinctive about her because mm. it made the context into which, or out of which, she became a writer and an intellectual and a, a, a historical figure legible because those worlds are gone. We don't have access to, to, to those sorts of people. And she brought, you know, the intellectual life of, you know, Siena in the pre-war, mm -hmm. um, Australia, Naples, you know. She was with, you know, with the first group that went down to look at, I don't know, the, the Villa di Papiri in, you know, because she was friends mm -hmm. with those historians and, and those people. And know. she was a wonderful observer as well. Extraordinary I mean, she observer. Gets it. Yeah. yeah. And, and but, in, but in some of her diaries, correct me if I got this wrong, it seems as if you have access through her personal writing um, to things that are going to get, get grow into yeah, yeah. aspects of the novel yes. um, or characters in the novels. And that's an astonishing yes. privilege and insight and bit of luck. And there's, there's a lot more there. Okay. Um, a lot of it was you know, difficult to access, but I already had so much. And the, the tricky thing is I've written the, I found those notebooks really late. I had been through her stuff many times, mm -hmm. and I was in the archives at Columbia. It was all unsorted, so I was kind of the only person that had, who was allowed to look at them. And there was one last box. I had my, my husband there photographing the diaries, just giving a sense of where they, um, where they were. I had 30, 38,000 photos on my phone. I'm mm -hmm. still getting rid of them. So there's um, another book to write. <laughs> 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 And, um, and then there was one box, and I was like, oh, there's not much in here. And then with these, these little, sort of, like, big exercise books, I was like, oh, I wonder what they are, you know. Opened it up, and I was like, oh my god, this is her diary from 1960, when she gets her first story published. And there were, like, six of them. And so they took, so she always said, when I got the letter from William Maxwell, saying, we love your story, we're going to publish it, here's a check, have you any more? And she said, I, I went over to the hills to Siena and bought a notebook and I wrote in it on the back page because I didn't think what I had to say was important enough to start from the beginning. And there it is, the notebook that she writes in from the back. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and you have the diary for when Stigmula died. Oh. The, as it were, the grief, the grief mm -hmm. notes my God, that she wrote. As if she's getting through it by writing oh, her every day. And mm -hmm. reading those, 
through COVID was was yeah. was pretty yeah. grippy. And when you were here nearly ten years ago, yeah. you I looked back at what your as it were your visiting scholar proposal was, and it's very interesting to me now. I've forgotten this. You said you were writing, you were going to yes. write a joint life, a double life of Hazard and Stigmola. And it's very interesting to me tonight that you spent quite a lot of time on the very interesting, complicated question of whether Stigmola was really gay. You didn't, as it were, spend a lot of time ask, uh, talking about whether Hazard was gay, for mm. instance. I mean, I, yeah, I guess it doesn't arrive, you know. <laughs> but, but it was very fascinating to me that you, you, there's a kind of magnetism in Stigmola for you. Absolutely. And I, I want to ask how you eventually, A, decided, no, this wasn't going to be a joint book, it was going to be about her. And then how you yeah. stopped him from overwhelming the book, yeah, because yeah. he is an astonishing, Amazing. incredibly yeah. impressive person. Beautiful. Yeah, beautiful writer. Um, well, the simple question was, mm. Barrister House and Giroud wanted a biography of Shirley. They said, uh, you know, Geisy said, it, it will be, Francis won't get his own biography, so it needs to be his as well, okay. but it's Shirley's book, so that's what they wanted. I had uh, um, had interest from Columbia, they were interested in a, a less biographical, but, but kind of popular book about, I, I, I mean, to me, the two of them in their works span the long 20th century, from mm -hmm. Flaubert to, you know, kind of the, the Great Fire, and that, that was a project that, that was but a more scholarly project that morphed into the biography. Do you, see, do, you see them, do you see any mutual influence in their work? Do you think they influenced each other as writers? Yes, absolutely. Um, and they, they read together, I mean, famously reading aloud together, but they were reading what each other was, was writing about all the time. And, I mean, Stephen wrote two books right at the end of his life. He had dementia for the last decade, and he published these two books and Shirley put aside her own writing and she was quite upfront about this. She said, my husband you know, had failing memory and he needed help to, to work on his mm -hmm. book. So I don't know exactly what work she was doing, but she was doing work to support him and maybe even helping with the writing of, of those two books. Yes. Interesting. Yeah. So he's a, a, I'm sure everybody knows something of the work of Francis Stigmuller and his work on Flaubert and, and many others. But he's, he is the sort of par paragon or paradigm, I'm not quite sure which word to use, of the literary writer. Yeah. She, she is, uh, you describe this very interestingly, she's a kind of self made, she seems to have come like Athene, fully yeah, fledged yeah, from yeah. Zeus, Zeus's forehead. She, she seems to be completely self made and self created and to be fully fledged yes. at the moment that she's not, I'm gripped by the fact that you didn't find any um, manuscripts. I'm so what sense did you get when she talks about having all these different versions of transit and being, what sense did you get of the, the writing process and of what what influence do you have talked about, you know, did she write the way she did because she'd been reading Proust or something? I mean what you know how did it come about, this astonishing style that you gave us these lovely examples of at the yeah. beginning? I think, I mean, I, I describe her style as aphoristic, mm -hmm. um, and there are these threads of poetry. Okay, so the other thing to say about her as a reader is that she was primarily a reader of poetry, a lover of poetry, and she was, she had an extraordinary memory for poetry. And that was another thing she did, was a little bit not fun, which was reciting reams and reams of poetry as a party trick. You know, in some, in some contexts, really good. And others, perhaps, <laughs> you know, a little, little bit too much. Um, but that embodying of the poetry that, that she said, she said she, with so many poets, Auden was one of them, mm. and there are others, um, Hardy, that it was almost the first time she read them as a young woman, it was like she was rediscovering them, as if she had known them before. There was this utterly personal and very kind mm. of corporeal engagement with them mm. that she kind of enclosed that, that poetry. So I think that's, so there are, and, and, and I talk about this in the biography, that beautiful line towards the end of the Transit of Venus, you know, Caro on the boat, and she's wearing a, a scarf over her dark hair, and there's been talk about the hair, and whether it was going to be dyed, and you know, this, this impending death, and, and the scarf 
balls from the hair, and then later, Ted remembers it was as if brightness fell from her hair, which of course was a line from Thomas Nash. Yeah. Brightness falls from the air. Brightness falls from the air. Brightness from the air. Yeah, fair dust of clothes. So, so, so you're quoting po that poetry is quoted a lot in the, lot. In the novels. Some of it I recognise and some of it I yes. didn't because I didn't know as much poetry. And Auden is fairly important too. Yes. Yeah. We all know if we read Auden that Auden was an English corrector, yes. a reviser. She so was cranky about you, some of that. So yeah. Do you think that these amazingly beautiful lyrics? intense sentences that make up the work. Do you think that she revised every single one of them as a poet would a line of poetry, or do you think they just came straight from the heads to the face? Both. I think, Both. I think okay. there are some, there are, and I did I used some of them in the book, just these little fragments that she notes down that then make their way into the book. There are others that you can see have gone through a process of, I mean, she wrote drafts of her letters you know, <laughs> right? You know, like she was just, and that's why she's not writing so many novels. So she writes these long, extraordinary <laughs> letters. Um, you know, and, and then, then there was all the talking, you know. Yes. <laughs> well, lucky for you about the letters. Yeah. <coughs> I could go on tonight, but I think there must be questions from the, uh, from, from the floor. Diana, we have got a mic, and I'm going to ask you if you would mind waiting to use it, because although we can hear you sometimes behind you. Thank you, and thank you for a wonderful talk, really absorbing. And I wonder if I could ask you to say a little bit more about the political context of Hazard's work, perhaps particularly in the light of that really extraordinary and very bitter response to her experience of the United Nations, which I think did form her sensibility in some ways. One of the things that I think is so remarkable about her work is the way in which such a literary sensibility, which you've spoken about, fuses with a, a passionate political interpretation of um, her experience of the world. Yes. Can you tell us a bit more about how you responded to that? Yes, thank you. It, um, it was an absolute, working at the United Nations in the early 1950s while the McCarthyite um, mm. investigations were going on was absolutely galvanizing for her. On one hand, she's there as a typist, you know, mm. disrespected and disrespecting, but she's there writing in the diaries, you know, her friends are being interrogated or, or dismissed. Um, and, and then she went off and wrote um, a, a very dull but, but really important book that, that showed that from the start, the UN had been compromised by its, you know, um, agreeing to investigation by the um, McCarran Committee, the McCarran investigation, so that it was already from the start beholden to the US government. And Shelley Hazard was a purist, and she was an idealist, mm -hmm. and for her, mm -hmm. after the horror of World War II and the lingering horror of World War I, which was also definitive for her, the fact that there could be world peace, and that the United Nations might be an engine of this, and that that possibility might be squandered by base political kind of necessity, um, was something she never came to terms with, she never accepted. So for the rest of us, it's sort of like, yeah, we know the UN is, you know, compromised, you know, it's better than not having it, you know, people, people have a kind of more pragmatic approach. She would never go with that, it was, it was, and the same when she discovered that, you know, when she revealed that Kurt Wildheim had been covering up his, his Nazi past, and, you know, she, she was not letting that story go, she was pursuing it. But she was also pursuing these tiny little issues, you know, like um, she noticed that Solzhenitsyn books had been removed from the bookshelves of a, a, a shop that was on UN territory in Geneva, and she thought this was censorship. You know, and, and so she's getting writers, and she got, you know, Grand Green to write about it, she got various you know, people to support her, but it's sort of like, really? You know, <laughs> she never she never let go, did she? she, I mean, she it just went on and uh, on. Oh, and it's static. There's no sense of right. needing to live in the world. But reading through her political um, essays, 
and there's a selection of them in that, that 2016 book that I was yeah. doing, working on while I was here. I mean, it's not just the UN, it's, I mean, the, the, the involvement of the Shah of Iran in kind of, you know, International Women's Day celebrations and so on, and the, the kind of, the way that world political institutions are beholden to what she saw as figures, you know, of, of, of perfidy. Um, that's really high level kind of mm -hmm. political writing. Um, how it fits with the novels, the novels are for particularly the Trans of Venus, uh, to an extent also The Great Fire, they are about people taking their place in the public world really seriously. You know, Ted Tice, the scientist, stands up for the, you know, the right place to sign a tel uh, telescope, you know, because for science rather than politics and, and has, has, you know, repercussions because of that. And and that's that's part of that morality then, mm -hmm. you know. But, but she also yeah. gets rich satirical pickings out of the UN in her stories, which I love. They're very staling and funny. And, and so true of bureaucracy today. I mean, they should be writing about the modern Australian mm -hmm. university. Yes, another question. Thank you. Thank you. I have to go back. Just, just take, take the mic. Okay. Okay. I have to confess I haven't read any um, Hazard at all, and I haven't heard of Digmuller. Um, you will now. <laughs> yeah. I just want to say thank you for a couple of things you've said. Um, one of which is about the undisclosed. Um, and I, I know that she was, you said, I, I would be interested in her analysis, but the undisclosed is really important somehow. And I keep looking at resentful obscurity because there was something about her childhood maybe that was obscure. And I was thinking about calling her an autodidact. Um, and maybe if you're overlooked, there is a resentment. If you're marginalised, if you're a bit the other side of the world, you know, you're, you're drawn to this sort of tradition of European literature. Um, but you don't want to be part of that because you are part of something else. Or you do want to be part of it. And my experience of going to Australia was I had quite a lot of resistance. But I'll tell you what really sort of struck me, and, and in the bits you, you, you read today, there's a physicality about me being in Australia, which is, and you talked about embodiment, and that means poetry for me. There's something about the experience of being in Australia for me which was just the significance of the landscape, the significance of being on the edge, you know, and also you had to be brave, and you had to sort of really push into. I remember going to, a, and this is a very trivial example, I, I went to a reception and we were staying in the, the desert, and I said, do you know we've got some food in the room, and I think you've got mice, and this guy looked at me and said, you're in the blood of this. <laughs> And I thought that was so like, get over it, you are in this place. Right. So those are just sort of series of okay. thoughts. I think, I mean, I think, the, I think the, uh, the point about what's been obscured yes. is, is a very fascinating one. Absolutely. Absolutely, and, and she goes back to it. She goes back to, um, particularly in Transit of Venus, that the convict history and the, you know, not just undistinguished, but the shameful kind of origins yeah. of, of the colony um, and then in the Great Fire, she goes back to the wide Australia policy and the shameful kind of history of that and the, the, the refusal to engage the modern world, you know, in, through that, that kind of mechanism until, until post-war. And, and, but, but there is also, so in the passage I read, she's up front about saying the shameful history, the colonial history of dispossession, you know. But she's living in a country with 60,000 years of continuous culture that she was not able to be aware of, the country at that time was unaware of. We are slowly, grudgingly, and resistantly moving towards acknowledgement of that, and yet, you know, you wouldn't have heard of the, you know, the, the great backward step that we've just taken, the, the great refusal yes. around acknowledging But it doesn't that. play out in her fiction, does it? No, she doesn't know how to write about no. it. it. Well, it's there as uh, a vacancy right. and, and she writes about it almost and, and it's too. very yeah. hard to read now mm. that that account of vacancy as standing in for mm. Indigenous First Nations mm. Australia because mm. yeah. Yes, Kate. Um, that's absolutely wonderful, thank you so much. 
Um, I wonder, first of all, there's a little sort of yes, no question, really. When she was in Naples in 44, did she know that William Walton and Susanna Walton and Laurence Olivier were there in Ischia, or was she not connected to them? No, not connected. She, she came in 56 oh, okay. with the Suez um, placement. Okay. That okay. With. But she wasn't part of that. There, there was these little pockets. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Francis had a connection to some of those um, oh. writers, but not, okay. but not her. Yeah. Um, and the other thing was that just this, this fascinating notebook that you discovered so late with her observations and, and what an observer she was. Reading her observations is sort of, sort of condensed into one book. Does it change? Were there any gems that you would never have expected? Was she observing things that you wouldn't have okay. expected her to? How did it relate to what went into the books and what? What does she never use? I mean, how, how does it change your relationship to what you find in her? Book? There were six of them, actually. I think the six or seven Gosh. books. So it's not it's not just one. Um, that was, you know, the, the kind of iconic one. Um, it's quite random, actually. There's there's drafts for quite boring talks in there. There's a lot of stuff that's that's not interesting. But there are the moments, you know, if you've read the Transit of Venus, you know that extraordinary plotting of in the, in the you know foretelling. Um, the, the combinations on, and, and that's the bit that she starts with. You know, you can see that she starts with, you know, years later, he's, he's going to die. You know, um, so that's the kind of kernel of the novel. That was rich, I think, for me. But yeah, it, it, it's it's a real mix. I hope that you know, in in the future, some other scholar will, will come and work on those diaries. No. <laughs> Not me. No, no, no. <laughs> Closing the door. <laughs> Question. I've been sort of brooding uh, as you've all been asking questions, which I suppose is about feminism. Mm -hmm. um, the the, the transit of Venus is my favourite, Shirley has on all, and I know I am not alone in that. And one of the things that gets me um, is this sort of ravaging sense of sorrow and anguish that particularly ca that Caro goes through, and that sense of the sort of Fatal, uh, fatal lack of correlation between people's lives. So you meet people at the wrong time, and you lose people because some stroke of fate <laughs> happens, and, and you're left, or, or you pick the wrong person, yes. um, and you're left in anguish, a actual anguish, physical anguish. This is always sort of, it seems to be suffered alone by the women in, in Hazard novels. There's no community of women. You know, you can't go and have a drink with your mates in the pub and say, God, this awful so-and-so. <laughs> um, you know, there's none of that. Or there's none of sort of, well, I'll pick myself up and become a kind of feminist heroine. So is she, is it of her era? Is she just totally not interested in feminism, do you think she is a kind of feminist in her no. own way? Well, no, she was very hostile to feminism as a, as a movement. She just didn't want anything to do with it. Um, but she's interested in strong women, in, in women's stories, in, you know, so she's in, in all sorts of ways a feminist, mm. even while she's hostile to feminism. She, she practiced what I would call a highly conventional kind of femininity. You know, she loved men. Uh, she loved men more, much more interested in men than in women. Mm -hmm. um, she she did have some great female friends, but not a community. Mm -hmm. um, she was very happy to, you know, do do the housework and take responsibility. I mean, she was kind of not as well, but she <laughs> saw it as her you know wifely responsibility, and um, was bereft without yeah. without a man. So. Um, you know, it, she's a contradiction, and, and I can think of, well, she was a good friend of Lillian Hellman. You know, there's there's someone mm -hmm. long, you know, generations before her, or, or, or indeed Christina Stead. But, but, but there are, you know, I, uh, Rosamund Lehman, yeah, Bowen, so many, so many. Anita Bruckner. I mean, this, a, this, is a, this is a kind of recognisable kind of... Oh, well, yes, the, yes, yeah. yeah. Any other question? Yes, please. Wait for the mic. Thank you. Thank you. Of sort of personal material and things, and yet her 
works kind of are in this uh, are only uh, presented in its fully formed yeah. version, even to the extent of this um, story to the New Yorker and her insistence that that was the first, as it were. And there's a sort of sense of her, I don't know whether there was any expectation on her part of the taking it as part of her sense of taking herself seriously, that there would be a biographer. And so you have this almost editing of her own life and papers and things to make so that she, her sense of herself is presented as she wants it to be. Yes. And I just wondered if you might comment on that. Yeah, I, I think there's, it, it sort of pulls two ways. There is the, the editing of everything of herself, the, um, well, the creating of herself, the imagining of, of a, a certain kind of vision of herself that she wants um, to go out there in the world. And, and she curated that very carefully through her interviews and, and so on. But she hung on to, you know, her, her youthful diaries from, you know, 1948, and, you know, Sylvia Plath, she was not, you know. It's, it, Sylvia Plath's beautiful diaries, you can see that the poet is already there. You know, Shirley's just whinging about, you know, the boyfriend not paying her enough attention, and so on, it's like, execrable. Um, but, but she left them for us to read. And, and some of them, during that first great romance, she, she goes back and writes in, as she's writing The Great Fire, she annotates those early diaries. So that line between the story as she tells it in the novel and that she remembers it and wants it to be, which is, which is all the kind of fantasy, you know. So um, I don't know. I suppose all of that adds up to, I think she didn't really know, you know. She knew she had some sense of needing to leave a legacy. She did not say, I want my papers burnt, you know, I don't want people reading my diaries mm -hmm. or my letters. You know, um, her friend, her great friend, the Australian writer Elizabeth Harrell, got rid of most of her own material, you know, that like, was really careful to, to, and Patrick White wanted all of his burnt, um, and his executor. Um, did, she know, did she know how good she was? Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah, so yeah. how did the papers get to Columbia? Sorry. Oh, the papers got to, um, she had arranged that beforehand. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, they, as I said, I, I saw them there, well, I saw them in the department and then in Colombia, and now they've all been uh, Camelot. Um, but some of, actually some of them went back to Australia, I had collected. She had kept, you know, the first books of poetry. Uh, so I had books from the 40s, 1940s, bought in Sydney, bought in Wellington, on the boat on the way to England. And I said to the executives, this should go to Sydney, and so they are now in the um, State Library of New South Wales. Um, so they're kind of annotated, there are letters in them, they're, you know. It's a fascinating like international that. afterlife, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, it's not in one place. Yeah. Do you have any Thank more you. questions? Ah, yeah. Great expression, great <laughs> affected the way you read novels mm. afterwards? Mm. No. <laughs> no, they're they, they just there and there. And, and people have asked me quite a lot over the last year, does, what, does, what does it change about the novels? It's not just me, I, I don't think, I don't know, I don't think biography does change what, what novels do. But, but just to follow up on Anne's, it's such a brilliant question. I mean, when I read your book, I thought, oh, Dora. I know Dora in Charles of Venus, this intolerable woman who it, it, you can't have enough of in the book. You know, the more intolerable she is, the more you want to read about her. She's just fabulous. Um, I, did, I didn't know until I read you. I didn't know that was her mother. Well, <laughs> she did say that she doesn't do. make her her mother. I mean, interestingly, no. she makes her an older sister. Yes. Um, well, because yeah. you know, that, that, she I'm sure all, that I could have noticed, it, but I didn't know. And it did change my feeling about the. Yeah. The novel, actually. And, and, and you know, in the letters, you just want to hear more about the terrible things the kid is doing. It's <laughs> really funny, you know? Yeah. Really, really funny. Time for one more, if anything. Yes, yes, please. Um, so just wait for the back and, and, and to reveal, you actually taught me the transcript of Venus 35 years ago. Oh my god! <laughs> so, my question, following on from that question, and it may be, it may be not applicable, has doing a biography changed the way you taught? I don't teach her now. I, I, I have taught her in the past, yeah, obviously. Right. But um, 
not respond well, I don't think, to the particular demands of reading. I don't know. Um, yeah. So that. that uh, what you mean? She's too long to teach. She's, she's too long. She's too erudite. She's too oh, rich. Yeah. Too yeah. sad. Ooh. You know, she's not relatable. I don't know. <laughs> um, but did you find that? So I would say, it's a, uh, uh, and I should say, I didn't have a career in English literature. I would say reading her was one of the most formative experiences of my university education. Wow. So it was probably very hard, but you know, it was very important. So in the in the course of this wonderful book, uh, which I greatly recommend to anyone who hasn't read, even though it is the, I, I was embarrassed when the the copies arrived. I've been so prolix. You quote a wonderful letter from Lionel Trilling to Steve Muller about his book, Flaubert and Madame Bovary, which came out in 1939. And Trilling says to Steve Muller, Flaubert would be proud of it, for in many ways it is Flaubertian. You've kept yourself out of it and have been objective, but not falsely objective. I mean, you haven't tried to keep out the love of your subject. Yes. And then he goes on to say, the lightness of the narrative touch never gives one any sense of insecurity about the scholarship which I can see is enormous. And I, I, I was thrilled to see that letter. I thought it's such a one, and it yes. says such important things about writing by Faye. And I also thought, well, that's the book I'm reading now. Um, <laughs> so I just want to say, I thought these qualities really shone through, and they've been shown up here tonight. And this wants to be generous and, and rich talk you've given us. So thank you so much.